All right. Well, uh, thanks for all coming out tonight. And uh, well, I love Jeremiah. I love especially, you know, the, the early chapters. But uh, chapter one was a really good chapter as well. I'm not going to be specifically preaching on chapter one, but uh, um, it was still very relevant to the sermon because the sermon tonight is called uh, Vain and Light Persons. So I was, I was reading through the Old Testament and I noticed something kept coming up. You know, we'd speak of vain people um, and we would call them the lowest of the people. This is what today we would call a low life or morally corrupt people. Um, so I'll get you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 12 and we'll start in verse 25. Um, but I just want to show you the character of what's described as a vain person or the, the lowest of the people because as people of God we don't want to be like this. Or we don't even want to be uh, associated with these people, which I'll show later on. But these are not good people. You know, so we'll just see how bad they are as the sermon goes on. But um, So there was a split between the northern and southern kingdom um, of Israel where Rehoboam took uh, the kingdom of Judah and Jeroboam took the, uh, the other kingdoms of Israel. Um, and it says then in 1 Kings 12.25, it says, Then Jeroboam built Shechem and Mount Ephraim, and dwelt therein, and went out from thence, and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall thy kingdom return to the house of return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam king of Judah. And they shall kill me, and go again to Rehoboam king of Judah. So he's worried about losing his kingdom. It says, Whereupon the king took counsel, and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So he's producing these two calves and saying, this is the God of Israel that, lo- that brought you out of Egypt. But this is obviously a false god. Verse 29, it says, And he set the one in Bethel, and the other one he put in Dan. And the thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. So again, the qualification was they must have been sons of Aaron and sons of Levi to be priests, but he just, he just took anyone who wanted to and just said, you can be priests of these false gods, these idols. It says in verse 32, And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so he did in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And so placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made, so he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So this is not a very good start for him. You know, so first the priest was supposed to be of the sons and generations of Aaron. Um, we see Jeroboam ordained the lowest of the people, morally corrupt men to be priests and sacrifice and to turn others to his false gods. You know, and it's a pattern you'll actually see through the scriptures of, of these type of men. You know, they will lead you after strange gods and to do immoral things, teaching to break the commandments and statutes of God. So in First Kings 13.33, it's the same story. It says, After this thing Jeroboam returned not to, from his evil way, but made again of the lowest of the people priests of the high places. Whosoever would, he consecrated him. That's whosoever wanted to, whoever put their hand up, he just consecrated them and said, you can be priests. It says, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from off the face of the earth. So I'll get you to turn to Second Kings uh, chapter 17. But we see the Lord here is wroth with Jeroboam, turning the hearts of the people against him. But it was also his ordination of the lowest of the people, making them priests, which is an abomination unto God. You know, it says he made again of the lowest of the people, the basest sort, morally corrupt men, to be priests. So whoever wanted to, he'd consecrate them. You know, so it's interesting to note, you know, these are people who wanted to be in these positions. They sought these positions out. So it wasn't because they were qualified, but men like this will always be attracted to positions of power. You know, they they want to take that power and influence and abuse it. Um, You'll see that with the wicked sons of Samuel, who were ordained priests. Um, But they were wicked men. They didn't fear God, you know. And um, they took bribes and they walked not after the ways of God. And the sons of Eli, they were wicked men who took the offerings belonging to God and they committed fornication with the women of the congregation. You know, they abused that power for their own gain. You know, and that's what these people will do, these vain and light persons. 
So you're there in 2 Kings 17, so we're looking at the Lord's wrath toward Israel, starting in verse 6. It says, In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Halar and Habor by the river Gozan and in the city of the Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and, and had feared other gods and walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God, and they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city, and set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them, and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger, for they served idols, whereof the Lord has said unto them, You shall not do this thing. So that's a great sin that they continued to do, to worship the idols and not the God that actually had brought them out of Egypt. Um, but in verse 13, it says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep your commandments and my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servant the prophets. So these true prophets of God, they were testifying against Israel. That was like your Jeremiah, your Isaiah, your Ezekiel. They were testifying against these false prophets. You know, and that was contrary to the message that came from within. You know, those vain and low people were causing Israel to sin a great sin. Verse 14, it says, Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the necks of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. So we'll read... Uh, in this passage between 14 and 20, um, you know, and I do recommend you read that yourself. But the children of, of Israel and Judah, they both rejected the Lord, but they also caused their children to be sacrificed unto idols. You know, they burnt their children in the fire, sacrificed to Baal, and went whoring after other gods. And in verse 20 we pick up, it says, And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel, and afflicted them, and delivered them into the hand of spoilers, until he had cast them out of his sight, for he rent Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam, Jeroboam drave Israel from following the Lord. This is what this wicked king did. And made them sin a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam which he did. They departed not from them. Until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria, under this day. So what was that sin they sinned? You know, so that goes back to First Kings 13, where he made of himself the lowest of the people, the priests, who caused the people to worship Baal, and they caused the, you know, the golden calf idols. But then we ask the question, did they learn their lesson? You know, from those who came after him, from after Jer Jeroboam, in doing this wicked thing, you know, taking this lowest of the people and making them priests. So we see again in verse 31 of uh, 2 Kings 17. It says, And the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sepharavites burned their children in fire to a Dramalek and an Amalek, the gods of Sepharvaim. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods, after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. Unto this day they do after their former manners. They fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes, or after their ordinances, or after the law and commandment which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel, with whom the Lord hath made a covenant, and charged them, saying, You shall not fear other gods, nor bow yourself to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. Howbeit they did not hearken, but they did after their former manner. So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. So again, they thought they could have it both ways. You know, you can't serve two gods. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve Baal and the Lord God. You know, one, only one of those is your deliverer. Only one of those is your saviour. You know, only one is the true God. And it's him and him only whom you must serve. And now they forgot that he was the one who delivered them out of Egypt. You know, he's the one who delivers us from our sins. 
So I'll get you to turn to Joshua chapter 24. But this is, you'll be familiar with this passage as well. It's the promise the children of Israel made to Joshua and to the Lord as they were divided into the tribes and the land was distributed. So this was after Moses' death. Um, this is the famous passage where, where Joshua states, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I love that statement from, from Joshua. I think everybody loves that statement. But in verse 22 of Joshua 24, it says, And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves, that ye have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice we will obey. Now, I believe when we get saved, we're making a similar statement to God. We're saying we're choosing you as our God. You know, we're going to take you because you're going to save us. You know, you're going to forgive our sins. So when, we're, you know, when we believe on Christ, you know, we're also accepting him as our God. You know, so we also should not obey the voice of a stranger. You know, we should not be hearkening to the voices of other gods you know, like these men will cause you to do. But that's a promise they made to God. You know, before entering into the land, there was a choice. You know, serve the Lord God and enter the land. Or serve your old gods and the gods of the heathen and stay in the lands. Again, I think if you, you know, if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, then I think you're, you're saying, you know, well, I don't want those old gods. I want you. You know, so again. But we'll look, at, we'll look further ahead. You know, past the reign of David, back to Jeroboam, when the kingdom was split into the, 12, uh, the 10 tribes of the north and the remaining tribes in the southern kingdom of Judah, and the kings which reigned after him. Um, we'll get you to turn to Second Chronicles 13. And now, but we're made up aware of just how wicked it is to ordain these men, these unqualified men and men of low report, morally corrupt men into positions such as priests. So, let me just have some water. So just Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 4. It says, And Abijah stood up upon Mount Zemarim, which is in the Mount Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his son by a covenant of salt? Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up and hath rebelled against the Lord. And there are gathered unto him vain men, the children of Belial, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and tender-hearted and could not withstand them. And now ye think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David, and ye be a great multitude, and there are with you golden calves which Jeroboam made you for gods. Have ye not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and have made you priests after the manner of the nations of other lands? So that whosoever cometh to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, the same may be a priest of them that are no gods. So you notice what God calls the men who were gathered with Jeroboam against Judah, that were vain men and children of Belial. You know, that's sons of the devil. That's what he calls them. You know, and they also cast out the legitimate priests, the sons of Aaron and the sons of Levi, and they ordained their own, whosoever came with a sacrifice they would ordain as priests. You know, and they replaced them. They replaced the people of God with sons of the devil. You know, I can think of a lot of so-called churches that have sodomite ministers, you know, that they've replaced the men of God with children of the devil. You know, and why do you think they're there? You know, Romans 1.21 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So again, you know, these are vain people, these sodomites. They are the vainest of people. You know, these vain men, these wicked men. You know, they don't belong behind a pulpit. So I'm going to bring us back to the New Testament shortly. But um, while we don't have positions of priests, we do have pastors, deacons. And on the other side, we have, you know, vain prophets or teachers in the New Testament. You know, and it's just as much of a warning against these men today. You know, we are not to follow men like this, 
that we're not to be men like this. You know, so I, I personally, I don't know how you could ordain a man into any of these positions who was unqualified according to the qualifications, either for the priest in Leviticus or for the New Testament application, Timothy and Titus, which gives us clear instructions on the position of a bishop or a pastor. You know, or the men with such low morals would either ordain themselves or other unqualified men and put them behind the pulpit. You know, you don't get to do that. You know, do you know who rose up uh, in the Bible, who rose up against the leader? It was Korah. Korah and his vain followers. You know, and what happened to them? You know, that was sent straight to the pit of hell. That's what happened to them. You know, so just be aware of how God feels about this. When you take unqualified men, you take these vain men, and you put them in positions where God has ordained true men to actually take these positions. You know, then there's also the ungodly movement of home church. You know, they have no leadership ordained by God and no accountability. You know, and it's exactly the same spirit of Korah. It's a false spirit. You know, this is not the Lord's church. He did not die so that Korah could stand up to the ordained men of God and say, we don't want you to rule over us, we'll do it ourselves. You know, and he didn't die so that the church could take the coveted position of bishop and you can use it to fulfill your own lusts. That's not why Christ died for the church. He died for the brethren. He died for us. You know, there needs to be a lot more respect for this institution than there is in this world. So I'll get you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. I'll just read to you from Proverbs and Psalms. Proverbs 12, 11 says, He that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. We see something similar in Proverbs 28:19. It says, He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread, but he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. So this also indicates, you know, that these vain persons, they're busybodies and they're lazy. You know, so they're seeking for an easy way to get through life, maybe by running a church and getting free money from all the people, you know. But most legitimate people, pastors that I know, they have, a, they have at least a part-time job. You know, if the church is unable to support them, they'll support themselves and their family. You know, now if the church can support you, then yes, the, you know, the pastor, the, the laborer is worthy of his reward. The pastor should be paid, amen. Um, but if the church is unable to support you, you should be willing to work part-time to, to support yourself and your family, whatever it takes. You can't just be a lazy man in poverty when you're a pastor. But a lot of these men, you find they are lazy, you know, and I think Proverbs here is telling us that, you know, and we aren't to company with these people either, you know, they're always going to be a bad influence on you, and this is what David said in Psalms, Psalms 26 verse 4, he says, I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers, I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will, I, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. So in Jeremiah 2, we also see this, these vain persons, they're the same men that deny the Lord God, and their purpose is to get you to, to do the same. So we'll be in verse, uh, verse 4, Jeremiah 2. He says, Hear ye the way of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through, and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof, but when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. So these vain men, these unqualified men, they care more for themselves than they do for you. And they don't care at all for the words and statutes of the Lord. You know, and they're going to lead you astray into disobeying these things 
but also into following other gods and strange doctrines. So in Jeremiah 23, verse 1, if you want to turn there, it might be too far away. It's a bit warm tonight. So Jeremiah 23, verse 1, it says, Woe unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And drop down to verse 10. It says, For the land is full of adulterers, for because of the swearing the land more mourneth that pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their course is evil, and their force is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, said the Lord. You know, again, it's in their house. Like, we don't want to have this in our house. If anyone walked in and tried to do that in this house, I'd be throwing them out so quickly. I know any of the men here would too. But how can you have churches that have these men that will stand up and say these profane things? You know, it's just disgusting. It makes me sick. Okay, so, yeah, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore, their, their way shall be under them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein. For I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. So the people have become extremely wicked. And we see the reason why, following on in verse 13. It says, And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. I have also seen in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of the evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them as unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. I mean, what a horrible thing to have said about you. you know, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood, and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. Down to verse 25. I have heard what the prophets said, that they prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. And I want you to pay attention to that, deceit of their own heart. Verse 27, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. Verse 32, you hold on against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. And this is how the chapter concludes in verse 39 and 40. He said, Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you and will forsake you and the city that I gave you and your fathers and cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach against you and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. You know, you're going to see this exact same thing as well in the Lamentations of Jeremiah, in Ezekiel chapters 12 and 13, and in Zechariah chapter 10. You know, so all the prophets were dealing with this. But the best example we have of this in current day are your Pentecostals and Charismatics, or Baptocostals these days. It seems they're slipping in there as well. You know, they believe they hear from God and they prophesy in his name falsely, just like these false prophets did. The Lord says in Ezekiel 13, 7, Have you not seen a vain vision? Have you not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. Now, so if anyone proclaims to speak for the Lord, but they're not quoting from the words of God, King James Bible, I mean, just be, just be aware of that, because they're not speaking the words of God. If they're not speaking the words of God, they're speaking of their own deceit of their own heart, you know, their own vain imaginations. 2 Peter 1, 19, and I love this passage of Scripture. We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy 
of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I'll get you to turn to Titus chapter 1. So turn to Titus chapter 1. But we have a more sure word that was not given by man, but was given by God. You know, and the same cannot be said today as the scripture has concluded. We've got everything from the creation of the earth in Genesis to the destruction to the new heaven and the new earth, the end of Revelation. There's nothing more to add to the word of God. You know, and these people believe vainly that they can gain extra biblical revelation through the voices that are in their head, through the deceitfulness of their own heart. You know, but that's not of God. And they're not the words of God. You can't prophesy in his name, you know, with the words of your own vanity. And God's made it clear how much he hates that. And I will put it to you. Anyone who's read this book, the King James Bible, cover to cover, you understand that it's complete. There is no, there's nothing to seek after this. There's no other revelation, whether it's by book or some other false prophet. So you'll be there in, in Titus chapter 1. We'll read from verse 10. It says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They possess that they know, profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So again, they're vain talkers and deceivers. They are one and the same. You know, and the Jews were well known for this, but it's not just them. You know, there are many false prophets who will try and walk into a church like this. You know, many sodomites who will try and infiltrate a church like this. So we're just always to be aware of their existence, and to be aware that those who seek to take you aside and teach you strange doctrines, or would seek to hold positions of power over people, they're the people to watch out for. So uh, I'll get you to turn to Second Timothy 2. And after that, we'll be in Colossians chapter 2. So 2 Timothy 2.14 says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. So again, this is how you protect yourself from these people. You study the word for yourself. You know what the Bible says. So when these people try and lie and deceive you, they can't do it because you know the truth. It says in verse 16, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat at Dothakanka, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have heard, saying the resurrection is past already, and have overthrown the faith of some. You see something similar in First Timothy chapter 1. But again, he's, Paul's naming these men, you know, who have taken these people aside and, and tried to teach them false doctrine. You know, you need to watch out for these people. If they pull you aside and they try and teach you something strange or something new, just be aware and even warn other people about that. You know, you should definitely be going to Pastor Kevin about that. Um, but in Colossians 2 verse 6, it says, as you, have, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up in his own mind. You know, so again, be, be careful around such people, but also rebuke them. You know, but how does this apply to us today? And what do I want you to take away from this sermon? 
So there's, uh, there's three points here. You know, first, don't appoint yourself or any unqualified persons as leaders, pastors, deacons, contrary to the word and instruction of God. If someone's unqualified, that should be a warning not to follow that man. You know, because God's given him, given him his qualifications, so we need to follow them. Secondly, do not prophesy falsely in the name of the Lord, using your own thoughts and vain imaginations and proclaiming that it came from God. You know, this is wicked, and the Lord hates those who speak falsely for him. And uh, Job gives an admonition to his friends in Job 13.7. He says, will you, speak deceit, uh, will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? I mean, that's not something we want to do. And Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Now, you want to speak any words that are not in here? Then you're going to be shown a liar. Because God didn't speak those things unless they're in this book. So, and the third is to be rooted and grounded in your faith. Established in the word of God as you have been taught. You know, so don't let these men lead you after strange gods or to cause you to cease from keeping the statutes and commandments of God. Malachi 3.13, it says, Your words have been stout against me, said the Lord. Yet you say, Where have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. So in this wicked world where they call the proud happy, with these faggots and these thinking God-hating reprobates, you know, the LGBT and the feminist agenda, remember, it's never vain to follow the statutes of God. You know, but what we should follow is faithful men. You know, men we have, like in this church, we have good faithful men. And we should always follow the faithful men and not the vain and white persons. You know, men who also teach the commandments, but do them also. 